He's there. You're up. All right, call the meeting to order. Herman Marks will lead us in our invocation <clears throat> pledge. Our Father, we are truly grateful to be here this evening. We thank you for the opportunity to serve, not only in Decatur, but to have an impact on the state of Alabama. We thank you for our public servants, and we thank you for their dedication. We ask now that you lead and guide and direct us this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thanks, Herman. Roll call. Micah. Here. McMaster. Here. Jackson. Kyle. Here. Hi. Excuse me. Yeah, Pepper. Pepper. Won't be here. Pepper. Huh? Are you here? Oh, here. <laughs> All right. Uh, one item on this uh, agenda resolution 23013, award bid number 23008 for short term rental of a dozier for the landfill to heavy machine LLC. So moved. Motion by Mr. Pepper. Second. Second by Mr. Pike. Uh, any discussion? Got two bids, and this is kind of a stopgap until we get the new one, well, which we'll talk about. She's had trouble with those. Okay, just <laughs> Okay, so last month you all approved the undercarriage for the D7. Parts finally came in. They picked it up. Right before, two days before they picked it up, I had a fire uh, with the A50, and it burned the, the hot the, it had to replace the harness and a few wires. It's at Warrior, so both are, one's at Thompson, the other one's at Warrior. So this would be a rental dozer during that intro. Yeah, I, the good news, the D7 has tracks, but the drive seals are an issue, so it might be another week. We gotta have but yeah, we have to have a dozer. We, and we, we currently are renting, but this is more um, to help us in the longer term. Longer term. Yeah. All right, any other discussion? Roll call? Aye. 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 All right. Resolution 23013 is approved 4 to 0. Uh, anything else for this meeting? All right, we're adjourned. <laughs> that was our quickest meeting ever. No. 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 We got them shorter than that. throwing the shots today, ain't he? Have we not? That was three, less than, that was two minutes. Was two minutes. We, we literally had one where we were here for a minute. There was zero, the, the prayer and the pledge lasted twice as long as the vote. Dane's our, Dane's our go-to for a short prayer. Last time he was about... Hey, Dane's prayers or Al Jones?
that. All right, it is five o'clock. I appreciate everybody uh, being here tonight. We are going to move through our agenda to get uh, prepared for our council meeting for next week. Uh, we do have a couple of uh, presentations. Thank everybody for coming tonight. And I'll let Kelly Thomas is going to give us, uh, has a couple of topics. I'll let her go first and then we'll move to the CEO of the folks after that. Thank you, Council President. The first item on my agenda is the tandem bike share agreement. So this is a bike share agreement that Decatur Morgan County Tourism and Downtown Redevelopment approached Blue Cross Blue Shield about sponsoring last year. Um, they agreed to sponsor a one-year lease of bike share for $30,000. That lease would actually start when we sign the contract, um, pending y'all's approval. It would be for three separate bike stations with five rental bikes each. The cost for a bike rental for a citizen would be $2 per hour. That charge would then go through the Movatic app, which is done on your phone. Anything that goes through the Movatic app is then deposited into an account of the city's choosing. So y'all would get those deposits every two weeks through a third party paying agency called Stripe. Um, the contract will be up for renewal after a year if we would like to. Um, I've already talked with Tandem about if we have good use of the bike station since they can track them through the app. We'd like to present that to Blue Cross Blue Shield again for a second year of sponsorship. So instead of getting the city to pay for it the second year, hopefully with good use, we can show Blue Cross that it would be a fruitful investment for them to come a second year. So we're asking the city just to approve this use of the bike share agreement at no charge. Where are the sites? The sites that we're tentatively proposing are going to be in front of the Alabama Center for the Arts, Rhodes Ferry Park, and then one at Point Mallard. All right, uh, Herman, anything from your point of view? So somebody would go to the city of Decatur? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, and <laughs> we're actually paying y'all to put this in. And they said that you, of course, can do whatever you'd like with it, but if we choose to use it to buy additional bikes for the lease the following year, we could do that. That's but what I was going to ask. If it is successful, the next year we could just increase the number of stations? Yes. Okay. yes. And again, they can track the number of uses and which station is being used the most. Um, one thing that Point Mallard and I discussed today was mm -hmm. if their station is not being utilized, can we move it? And they said we can during the year. So. Um, with all of the data tracking, we should be able to easily tell which stations are being best utilized, and if not, we can relocate them. How many bikes was it per station? Five. Five. And they, they will not be bike litter, as um, some people would like to call it, because once you rent the bike, you actually have to return it to the station for your card to quit being charged. So you can't just drop it on the sidewalk or the street. Yeah, like lime or whatever. Those, right. Yeah, the scooters. Mm -hmm. Good. All right, um, and you have a kind of time frame on needing? We would like to go ahead and ask you to add this to the agenda for Monday, um, February 6th, because the turnaround time for ordering the bikes is two months, so we'd really love to roll this out this spring. And once again, when we sign the contract, it would start a year. So if we say April of this year, the bikes start, they would go till April of the following year. Do you know, I, I'm, these things are all over the place, so I'm sure there's there's an answer to this, but liability to the city if somebody were to wreck it and didn't have a helmet on, is that, is that a Herman our, question? one of our lawyers okay. answer that. They both looked at the contracts. That's a potential, <laughs> here's Doug. <laughs> <laughs> and Doug, if, you'll, if you don't mind coming to the podium. Yes, I would like to do something. He did not, but I'll allow him to speak. Really? <laughs> <laughs> um, Doug Backus, uh, Decatur, uh, now Backus Green Law Firm. Uh, we've had the opportunity to, to speak with um, uh, Herman and uh, in, in the contract that's been proposed from Tandem, uh, the green proposal with Tandem, uh, limiting the liability, keep liability away from the city. Of course, you can't ever prevent city from being sued, but um, that will be covered mostly through the agreement of tandem and not bringing any to um, the city and hopefully not DDRA either. All right. Any other questions? 
I don't have an issue adding this. I mean, um, we can discuss it. If anybody has an issue next week, we can discuss it then. But we can we can add it. I'm fine with that. All right. Um, any other questions, comments? And I know Kelly, you've got another item. And I will just say it's the same program that Huntsville has. So if you're familiar with the Huntsville bike share, it's the same exact thing if you've used that program. All right, the next item on my agenda is the Johnston Street Alley project. So this is the alleyway between Whist and Rail Yard below the Johnston Street level. Um, we received a $100,000 grant from RCD that is reimbursable once the project is complete. We've also received a $20,000 corporate sponsorship for this project, and we've tentatively got other corporate sponsors that are willing to partner on this project as well. Um, we are going to say right now, based on the current construction bids that we've received, that this project budget is at $270,000. If you look at the rendering in front of you, that includes a performance area, seating, um, stamped concrete, landscaping, irrigation, lighting, and it also includes a slide and staircase on the Johnston Street level. We thought this would be a super fun artsy alley to bring to the area, especially since we lost Jones Park. The last thing we want downtown to be is a concrete jungle. We have so much development happening right now. We've closed out 2022 with over 63 million in development just in downtown, and that was from other developers, not the city. So this is just a small project that we would like to do to complement those developments. We've partnered with the Alabama Center for the Arts to put in a mural on the carriage house building that will actually look over the alleyway. So they're in the process of reviewing RFPs for that mural right now. They received a $2,500 grant from Decatur Morgan County Tourism to go towards that mural and then they'll cover the rest of the cost on that. So this $270,000 budget would cover the concept that you see in front of you. There are alternates on this concept that we would have to look at as far as building and construction costs go. Just as y'all know, it's crazy out there right now with the fluctuating prices. Um, so we are asking the city to partner with us on this project at $150,000. So you have 120 from other sources? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, any discussion questions and what about the WISC construction i mean i know they'd had some stuff in the alley and i think we had given them the some owner of that. are they done i mean i talked to the owner of the building two weeks ago and he said he expected all of his sewer work and anything that would affect the alley to be done by the end of this month okay so if this were to move forward yes. that wouldn't be an issue no. turn around and do it and tear it back up no and he's fully aware of this project um i've sent him the rendering so he knows what's going on as do the other building and owners so all the building owners they're aware the alley, of the they're aware no issues there carl when we looked at that a few years back we had utility issues we had a lot of different things that we had to deal with um now my recollection the way that i remember it it was considerably more than $270,000 at that particular point. Um, what's changed now? There, there has already been some utility improvements done. Is that correct? Yes. So we actually had to pay Decatur Utilities um, an aid to construction cost to do some preliminary work on a gas line in that alley. We've already completed that. And then they amped up the timeline on their reversal of the sewer in that alley too since the hotel and the parking deck and all of that other construction was happening downtown so now that isn't an issue for this project yeah from what i remember that was in their plan and when all this came about <coughs> they had expedited that process mm -hmm. to get some of that corrected it's part of the sewer rehab yes yeah yeah all right any other discussion I'd right. like to add it to the agenda for Monday night if y'all are okay with it. Um, this one, let me consider. I think the bike one's fine, but um, I'll talk with Herman about adding this okay. one. All right, any other questions, discussion? But if we do add this, we're looking at it coming from undesignated reserves. And assigned funds. Okay. <coughs> yep. All right, any other discussion? All right, thanks, Kelly. Thank y'all.
All right, and um, I'll let, I've got a number and who needs to go what, but I'm just going to turn it over to you guys for what you want to talk to us about, whatever order you want to talk in. When you come to the podium, if you'll just give your name and address and tell us what, what we need to hear. Council President, Councilman, uh, thank you for the uh, opportunity to uh, share or speak on behalf of the Tourism Board referencing the Judge James E. Horton House. How do we tell our story? That was a question that I was asked. Throughout the country, civil rights museums are a huge part of tourism. And in every one, there's an exhibit on the Scottsboro Boys' trials and the two landmark Supreme Court rulings. They're telling our story. They're telling our story. Just last year, civil rights tourism in Alabama at the Equal Justice Museum, over 500,000 people went through them. That's second to the Space and Rocket Center. The Judge James E. Horton House would be the civil rights diamond indicator. This historic house would be a site to learn to discuss legal, ethics, social, and civil rights issues to preserve the Scottsboro Boys' story and to honor the courage and bravery of Judge Horton. George Horton lived in this house when he was here presiding over those uh, cases from 1933 to 1937. It was this house where he wrote that lengthy decision to overturn Hayward Patterson's case uh, and second death sentence. And it was this house that Judge Horton retired after losing the election for a fair, for a fair decision. Councilman, all the roads lead to Decatur, all of them. Having the Horton House here is just a win-win for us with uh, an enormous economic impact, and we need you. What better place to have this house than here in Decatur? And you can help us bring it here. We need your financial support. Thank you. Ms. Towns. Yes. May it please the council, David Breland. I'm the manager of historic resources for the city, Level Fairway Drive here in Decatur. I want to apologize first for my appearance. Uh, no, I've not been in a barroom brawl or other fight. I uh, had a little eye procedure this morning. Uh, no, I don't feel wonderful, but I'm, I'm going to tell you, I wouldn't miss the chance to come and to support this uh, project uh, uh, for anything. Peggy has talked a little bit about the culture and the history of this project. What it would mean to the, the neighborhood of Old Town, which is perhaps the oldest neighborhood of our city, uh, would just be incredible. I too would like to talk though more about the economic benefits of this. Peggy mentioned that the Civil Rights Museum, the Legacy Museum in Montgomery, brought in an astounding 500,000 plus people last year. That's according to Lee Sintel, who is a Decatur, former Decatur resident and the, uh, the executive director of Alabama Tourism. That's half a million people. If you think about that, that is about eight times as many people as live here in Decatur, visited that museum. That is not an anomaly. The Civil Rights Institute in Birmingham brings in about 150,000 uh, tourists a year. Civil Rights Museums uh, nationwide are probably the, the hottest commodity, if you wish to put it in those terms, out there as far as museums. Uh, people flock to them uh, to learn about the history and the culture of them. So I would just like for you to think about that figure. We're not promising we'd have half a million people here. Uh, I, I think we know that, boy, that would be exciting, but boy, would that be a reach. But I think we, we could bring a very good crowd here. These folks, of course, would stay in hotels, eat in our restaurants, go to other attractions. Uh, just as an economic windfall for this city, I think it would be tremendous, not to mention the historical and, and the cultural aspects of it. So I appreciate uh, this minute that you've given me to talk about this and uh, encourage your support. By the way, we have very wide 
community support. I think you have received some uh, some information in the past about this, uh, some letters of support, that kind of thing, very, very broad support. Uh, and and to, to start out with one of the leading uh, board members of our tourism uh, group, I think that, that tells you a lot of the story. Thank you all so much. Judge. Gerald cleans up a lot better than I do. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, good evening. Uh, Gerald Genright, Gerald G. Genright, as a matter of fact. Um, Gerald with a G, Genright with a G. Pleasure to be here tonight. Um, city Council persons, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you tonight. But before I start, I I'd like to introduce a special family. Uh, Susan, with you and your sister Stan, these are representatives of the Horton family. What you just saw was a glimpse of the offsprings of courage because those are Judge Horton's granddaughters. I'm going to speak more about courage in just a moment. But I'm going to start and, and move quickly because I've got to put 90 years of um, history in about five minutes. My objective is to help in the presentation representing CIOTA to ask for assistance from the City Council. So let's get started. I'm going to start by first uh, asking the Council to look at this as a unique opportunity. As a matter of fact, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. So I'd, I'd ask you not to measure this by anything that you've seen because you've never seen anything like this before. Nothing like this has ever come before you and may not ever again. So I'm asking you to look at it to be as serious as it is. Now, as I mentioned before, I spoke of courage. And this decision is going to take courage, it's going to take insight, and it's going to take imagination from city leadership. Now, I'm going to start with a question, and that question is, what puts a city on the civil rights map? Okay, Bad things and good things. Judge Horton and Peggy both mentioned Birmingham and Montgomery. Let's talk about that a little bit more and, and let's add Decatur to the mix. As far as the bad, as we look at Birmingham, fire hoses, attack dogs used on peaceful protesters, churches and homes bombed, children killed. That was bad. Now, what is the good? The good is the Birmingham Civil Rights Museum. For over 20 years, this museum has been one of the most visited museums, civil rights museums in the country. Now let's look at Montgomery. What is the bad? Over the same period of time as we look at the civil rights struggles of 50s, 60s, and 70s, and you can go in either direction to know that it was there then, before the 50s, and it's still here. But let's talk about the bad, the lynchings, the beatings, the rapes, and the other unspeakable atrocities. That was bad. What is the good? The Legacy Museum that's been mentioned a couple of times already that we talked about as we talked about the fact that they have recently recorded having 500,000 visitors coming through there. Have any of you been to the Legacy Museum? Yep. You know what I'm talking about. You can come out of there almost needing a handkerchief. I mean, it is something else. And it's not just because it was bad, it's because they took the bad and they made good. Those of you that went, would you say, I'm, okay. Well, and the audience, if you've ever been there before, you know that I'm telling you as it is. Now, let's look at Decatur. 
Because Decatur does not get a free pass. Because in addition to civil rights struggles, the Scottsboro Boys trial stands out where we know nine black boys were falsely accused of raping two white women on a train traveling from Tennessee to Alabama. And when these trials were transferred to Decatur from Scottsboro, the neighborhoods were terrorized, vandalized, and all other sorts of awful actions because it was here. Now, the thing here is, that was the bad. What is the good? The good is the Scottsboro Boys Civil Rights Museum that we are developing. Just as Montgomery and Birmingham took the bad and made the good. What am I about to say? It's time for Decatur to make its good. Now, I have 990s, Birmingham Legacy Museum. What does this show? This shows you that these entities, having took the bad and made good, they're capitalizing on the civil rights tourism dollar. Decatur isn't even in the picture. But don't you think Decatur's story is as, as profound? It's a big pie. Decatur has nothing of that pie. It's plain to see that civil rights is a huge pie. And the fact that millions of dollars are flowing, we're saying that Decatur could not only be getting a piece of the pie, Decatur could be the gateway of civil rights in Alabama. Because when you're heading north, coming out of Tennessee, what do you hit first? Decatur. Before you hit Birmingham, before you hit Montgomery. Am I getting through to you guys? I'm seeing a smile, I'm seeing a smile, I'm seeing a smile, I'm seeing a nod. <coughs> okay? Because we, we're serious about this. We are very serious about it. To the extent to say that we want to address some of the objections before they even come up. One would be wanting to debate the merits of the project. I really don't think anybody would want to go there because that's going to be a hard debate to win. The next would be the cost. Now, I've just outlined the financial benefits and healing opportunity. Why would cost be an issue? The question should be, how much is it going to cost if we miss this opportunity? How much, it, how much will it cost if we let this go? Remember, this is a once in a lifetime op opportunity. Now, the next one is, this may touch a nerve, the city doesn't have money for that. Well, we know the city finds money for whatever they want to do when they want to do it. Everybody's quiet. Do we not get agreement here? Some say, let this be something that you want to do. Let's make it happen. We've been out here struggling for years to bring it to this point. We need you to help tug this thing and take it across the, the actual finish line. Now, I'll say, Councilman, we know that this is a heavy lift. But let me tell you, we've already lifted it. Look at the people in here that's supporting it. It's already on our shoulders. What we're asking you to do is help us fund it so that we can bring the Horton House to its future home in Old Town Decatur. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you.
Thank you, sir. You lost the time as well. <laughs> Tate, are you? I think you're next. I think okay. you're number four. <laughs> Francis Tate, 506 Monroe Drive, Decatur, Alabama. This is in closing. This is a part of the African Americans and the city's history. We simply must bring this irreplaceable piece of history. <clears throat> home to Decatur, where it belongs. There is no building we could ever build or fabricate that has the soul and the spirit of that time. And we can have it for free. It is unthinkable not to celebrate Judge James E. Hoyt, the Scottsboro Boys, and the events surrounding the trials. It will not only be civil rights angle driving revenue into the area, it is also the lure of a multi-use educational center celebrating the two Supreme Court landmark ruling that happened right here in Decatur. This will provide educational opportunities on an ongoing basis, hosting events, accredited classes, and workshop for generation of future lawmakers. This is Decatur's chance to turn a painful past into an oasis of remembrance, community, inclusion, and ongoing healing and become heroes. But it has to start here in Decatur. <coughs> Our Scottsboro Boys Civil Rights Museum can become a beacon of hope, education, and tourism, and ensure that those who suffer those horrific injustice will never be forgotten. I am appealing to the city council to become involved, engage, and supportive of this project and help us to bring it to fruition and approve this request because this investment you make today will continue far beyond our lifetime and will benefit the whole community and all of North Alabama. We realize that's a million dollars a chunk of money. <clears throat> but if you green light this project, you will be green lighting civil rights tourism. So as Susan Horton Faulkner quoted, it is the family hope that the activity schedule at the Scottsboro Boys Civil Rights Museum can become a destination for all who value fairness and justice. Thank you all for your attention and your time. If you have any questions, we'd be glad to answer them. I was going to ask you to stay for just a minute, but any questions for Ms. Tate or discussion? So the ask is for the city to donate one million dollars, mm -hmm. and is, will that cover the cost of moving the house from Mooresville here? From Greenbrier, Greenbrier right? One point two million, be exact. <laughs> so y'all got two hundred. Well, we possibly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a we couple have, of questions. Okay. Excuse, um, okay. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Okay, I just want to mention we do have support from the Tourist Bureau, the Chamber of Commerce, Mayor Dukes, Councilman Jackson, the Bar Association. Ronnie Dukes, we have a list of supporters that are major and want this project to become into fruition. Okay? Um, I'll just say, I think it's been nearly two years since I first met with you and Judge Breland, and I think there were some other people in the room when this first became um, something we wanted you guys brought to us. Um, and 
first off, I want to thank the, the Horton family of Judge Horton for allowing this to, to happen. Um, I would also say that nobody can make you see a vision for what she has in her head like Francis. Um, <laughs> when she talks about hundreds of thousands of people walking around Old Town and go into these museums, I can literally see it. And you've got to have somebody with that type of vision for a project like this. And I appreciate that. Um, I really do. The question, and at that time, I think we were, we had not crossed the path of what it was going to take to move utility lines, right? It was, it was really just the moving company's cost and I think it was in the 200, 300,000, somewhere in there. And between then and now, we discovered that it was gonna take more than that to move the utility lines to get the house here. And so it became 1.2 million or so. Um, what, I guess my question is, and you and I met, and Councilman Jackson, the three of us met, um, and I, I had mentioned uh, getting, trying to find financial support from other of course, the city being involved, but seeing if there was a way to get financial support. I, I mentioned the CVB, and I know y'all have representation on your board. Um, I think I mentioned the county, because this would be in Morgan County, um, and I don't know if they've been asked, but they should be. Um, and the other one I would say is hospitality. Um, hospitality um, is all about heads and beds. That's what they tell me. And if the tourism angle is correct, there'd be a lot of heads and beds from this project. And they have today $1.4 million in the account um, that the $2 room night charge goes to. Um, so I think they could be helpful as well. Um, I'm for this project. I do think it would be helpful, two things. One is to make sure we ask, just like you're asking us, all those other entities to be a part of it. And I would also say um, I, have, I have engaged, and I, you and I have talked about this, with a corporate, certain corporate entity to potentially help. And what they really need is to see, okay, we moved the project and we dropped the house in place. How do we get it open and bring in 500,000 people a year and, and it become? Because um, the um, Legacy Museum has a powerful organization behind it. The Equal Justice Initiative has got a lot of money um, and they've got a lot of resources to make something like that happen and can we engage them to potentially help us run that I don't know the answers to all those questions um, who you know who's going to be in charge of really running these things those are some of the questions I have I am fully supportive like I was from day one I'm one guy it takes three um, of of this project and the city being a part of it and moving the house here for all the reasons that have been said I, I do I'm interested in what the plan is once the house sits on that piece of property and it's oh, here, yeah, um, what that answer. looks like. May I, may I address Yeah, if you don't mind, just sure, Kevin, because sure. people I, watching online need to hear you. Uh, what we basically have been doing for, uh, we've been quietly working to figure out what we were doing in order to make sure that we were not making certain mistakes. We have met with the Cook's Museum. They're on board. They have offered uh, their help in, um, in our move toward this. We've met with the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. They're also on board. We've met with the Legacy. We went down and spent hours with Birmingham, hours with the Legacy to say, this thing is something that we don't know exactly how to do certain things. Will you help us? Each one of them graciously said, whatever we need to do to help you to get this thing done, count us in. So I hope that in that you hear the answer to your question. Not only that, we have engaged other experts in museum building, funding, and so forth who are also aboard. What we're doing is uh, quietly looking at gaining support from not only in-kind individuals and entities, we're also looking and raising money for other segments of the project. Now, I'm gonna throw this in, although this wasn't brought 
out in, at first, but this project consists of three phases. The first phase is the existing house that's sitting over there on Sycamore. Now, I think if you remember that house from years ago, it sat there for 10 years almost about to drop down. I mean, it was a dilapidated something. As a matter of fact, it was probably only suitable to tear down or use in an Alfred Hitchcock scary movie. I mean, it was an ugly thing. But if you go by there now, you'll see that it's no longer an eyesore. It looks good. It has a new roof. It has an, all sorts of things in terms of what needs to happen to bring that structure up. And although some things you can't see, we're doing a whole lot to bring that house to fruition. Next to that is gonna be a multi-million dollar state-of-the-art museum that we have sponsors sending the wings to move forward on that. Now, the Horton House fell out of the sky. I mean, we didn't even have that on our list to do. But the thing was, was that when uh, Susan and her family came and said that we're willing to do this, we had to shift gears, make a lot of things happen to make this fit because it made no sense to step away from this, again, once in a lifetime opportunity. So it's not like we're sitting around whittling our thumbs. We've got, we've got support, we've got experts, we've got plans. And the thing here is that what we don't have is the money now to bring that house from Greenbrier to Old Town. And to me, and when you mentioned the Cook Museum and Equal Justice Initiative, at this stage of the project, and, and I'm y'all tell me if I'm wrong, y'all have talked to them. Mm -hmm. I know this is true of the Cook Museum. They had an executive director of their museum at this point, where you guys are now conceptual, but we're making progress. They they had an executive director. In my, I mean, obviously moving it here is an ex, is it expensive. I mean, I think we'd all agree and it's, it's difficult. But my again, say we get it here, we got to have an executive director ready to go. We will have everything we need. So the money for that is is raised. The, the, the money for that is committed. Okay. Yeah, I can't. And I understand that a project like this, you you. you Nobody's going to want to give you any money till the building's in the yeah. spot. I get that. Yeah, the, money, um, the money for that is, um, is, is committed. Uh, all they're saying is, and I'll say this, uh, from a governmental source as well as a private source, uh, they said, get it here and we'll take it from there. So Gerald, I see. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought sure, you were finished. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I see this, uh, and I have to correct you when you said uh, when you're coming heading north out of Tennessee coming south. actually when you're heading south um, I, I got you uh, I, we all understood what you said you said but I see this sort of as a sort of a Robert Trent Jones trail type situation where people will connect the dots and they'll start going from one um, museum to the next and that creates revenue for our city and being in the car business people always think that you make money by selling cars you actually make money by buying. You have to buy low. And I think now, uh, one of you guys said earlier, um, what's the cost if we don't buy it or if we don't get into this? And I think that's kind of where we are, is that um, what's the cost if we don't get into this? Ms. Tate mentioned some landmark decisions, uh, 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 Supreme Court landmark decisions. And we know, we all know that two major decisions came out of this. And so this is Decatur's legacy. This is, and when we talk about, um, when we talk about quality of life, this court case opened a lot of eyes to quality of life and how people were being treated. And so I, I think that this is, it's so important that we find a way to do this. Now, I don't disagree uh, with Mr. Ladner in that, yes, we need to try to turn over every stone to find every dollar that we can to help with this. But from my perspective, um, I don't think that we can miss this vote. I think that we have to take advantage of the opportunity that we have. It won't be there for long, and we know that. We know that other people are looking at the house. Um, we know that it might end up in Athens or somewhere else if it does not end up here. 
And we know these things. Yeah. So, you know, I think that if other people see the value in it, it's important for us to see the value in it as well. So I, 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 um, I think that it's important that we get this here. I think that uh, we have spent money on things that I have just not understood why we spent money on. And I'll just, I'll say that openly. But I think that this is something that, uh, this is our legacy again. I, I've already said that, but this is something that's critical for our city. Yeah. This is something for crit that's critical for our city's growth and for us to overcome some of the stigma that we still continue to have as a city. Yeah, okay. you would have taken the van, you made it good. Thank you so much for that comment. And, and, Jack, and then I was going to quickly say, the fact of the matter is, can you imagine coming into, coming this way, coming south, <laughs> all sorts of signage to cater the gateway to the Civil Rights Trail? I mean, who could stop anywhere else but indicator to say that we started indicator? you know, where the gateway is. I mean, if, if, and as I mentioned earlier in my discussion, it's going to take imagination. And I think that based on what we've said today, you probably can see this. And again, all we're needing is help to do it. And again, another quick thing too, if you look at the board of directors, and I'm sure you know, you know each of those individuals, except for me, I'm from Birmingham, but I'm up here all night. We know how to get things done. We have a history of getting things done. So the thing here is that you're going to have a group of people that you're putting it in good hands, understanding that we've got to get return on investment and all of the other things that are normal to business, because that's how we are. That's in our blood. I think, and what I would I assume a lot of you are board members, and what I would challenge the board to do is when, when a corporate sponsor potentially of this wants to know, okay, I understand the project, I see it, I like it, I wanna be a part of it. Tell me how you're gonna get it from where it is today to 500 or some level of, of visitors coming a year. That's, that's the challenge I would give the board. And, and that, that right now is a roadblock, I think, again, not for us as much, but for trying to go and make this thing a reality. Yeah, say that again, I, I, I missed that. Which part? About the 500. Well, they said 500,000 visitors. But yeah, basically, the, you're the, looking for a performer. I, I'm, yeah. we, 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 yeah. you said yeah, we're I, not going to get, yes, that's yeah, exactly right. Forward. That, yeah. where, and, and, where we are today, how mm -hmm. we're going to get to the, how about this, the doors opening. Uh, I'm not going to have hold you to any you. numbers. Yeah. Well, I, and, and let's say this, I think that we've been given all sorts of numbers throughout history, and you guys weren't here, but the Cook's Museum told us that they were expect, expected to see 280,000 people per year. <laughs> Initially, sure. now that's what I that's what I was told, and that's what everybody was told in the presentation, that we would see 280,000 people per year. And I'm not saying that these this group should not try to exceed any number that they put out there before us. And I know that he did he didn't commit to 500,000, but I think that sometimes people just I don't want to say fraudulently, but they throw out numbers that are, aren't realistic. And I think if we get a realistic number from them as to what we should expect, then that should. That's a place for me. Uh, even less than that, I'm just asking for how you get okay. from where we are today to the right. floor, so. Good deal. Yeah, we'll, we'll get a performance. <clears throat> uh, Francis, I know you wanted to close. I this just up. want to uh, say you're absolutely right. And I do have a meeting with the hospitality group Wednesday. So. You want me to come? I'm just kidding. <laughs> if, you, if you like. But uh, we know the process, we know how to get it done. We just need your help and your support. Well, I think it's, and we, this is a topic that we won't let be just tonight and we don't talk about it again. I think it's a topic that needs some urgency um, and, and you and I can talk or whoever wants to talk, but I, I would appreciate just, if, I would like to hear publicly you come back and say none of those people, we talked to them and none of them will give a dime to this project because I'll be very disappointed in those groups um, but then we'll have to go from there and we'll know that everybody's been asked. Well, I cannot give you the name. No. Well, thank you all for being thank here. So um, Y'all even make it more visible than it was before. Um, so I appreciate that. And thank you to the board. And, and Frances has pushed this and pushed this. And I think she 
blowing my email up, and, and, I, <laughs> and I appreciate that, and she met with us, and we've met a few times um, regarding the project. So thank you guys for being here. You can feel free to stay uh, as we go through the agenda, or if you guys want to leave. Before you, you. before you leave, I want to, um, and Peggy Towns wrote something on her Facebook page. Um, we lost, and, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot, Peggy, I'm sure. but we lost a, um, an icon uh, over the past week and a half uh, in Mac Lewis. I'm just going to read uh, what Peggy put on her uh, Facebook page because whether you knew Mac or not, he worked for the Daily and Clint probably knew Mac well. And he said Mac Lewis wore many hats and as first local television cameraman, newspaper photographer, and firefighter. In 1964, he joined the Air Force and as a student at Lakeside High School, who, his, whose mother accepted his diploma. The Sunday he attended baccalaureate in parentheses, and the Sunday he attended baccalaureate, but on graduation day, he was in basic training. Making, making history in North Alabama after his, after his service to our country, excuse me, Mac Lewis was the first black camera, cameraman for all three local television stations. He was the first black camera person for the Decatur Daily newspaper as well. Mac loved photography, and as a Decatur newspaper article quoted him, I get close on a one-on-one -on -one ratio, I get close to it, excuse me, I get close on a one-on-one -on -one ratio filling viewfinder to a full size. Mr. I'm sorry, I lost it here. Mr. Lewis served as Decatur's black, first black firefighter. A lover of many sports, Mr. Lewis was also a member of the Decatur Rough Riders. Our sincerest con condolences and that you just extended condolences. Uh, but Mac shared with me many times that the trials that he went through just to become a firefighter for the city of Decatur. He wanted to be a firefighter, and, and we won't share the things that he had to do once he became a firefighter, but it, it was always a struggle for him. And Mac is the epitome of the person who overcame so many obstacles that were laid out in front of him, and that kind of goes back to what we're talking about tonight. We have over, had to overcome so many things, and because of people like Mac Lewis and because of the Scottsboro Boys uh, case, you know, Decatur is not the same place that it might have been without those uh, situations. So I want to thank you guys for coming tonight. I want to thank you for contributing. I'm sorry I stumbled through that, but uh, it, uh, Mac was a very important person for all of us in this community, and I just uh, thank you for sharing that on the Facebook page. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Hey, good night. Good night. You don't want to stay? <laughs> it gets way less interesting. So. I'm just looking for the other guy. He looks pretty good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, we will move through our agenda. Um, first item: approval of minutes. Uh, any questions on those? All right, set public hearings, ordinance 234548, approved rezoning request 141223 for property located at 4200 Central Avenue Southwest from an R5 single family patio home to an R6 single family semi-attached residential district. Set public hearing for March 6, 2023, 6 p.m. Uh, yes, this is the Glenmont subdivision on Central Avenue there. It was recently zoned for um, patio homes. The shifting market has them coming back now looking to rezone the southern portion of this property to townhomes to more fit what they think is a better product that they can bring to market. Um, this was recommended for approval. All right, any questions? Ordinance 234549, approved rezoning request 141323 for attractive land from N1 light industry to B5. Central Business District located at portions of 400 and 500 Bank Street. Set public hearing for March 6, 2023, 6 p.m. Yes, this is several properties um, on the 400 and 500 block of Bank Street there on either side of Cherry Street. Decatur Urban Ventures recently was able to purchase several of the properties and has it under common ownership. And this, so this is just the zoning step to get common zoning for all of those properties. And this was also recommended for approval. All right, any questions? Was that unanimous? Uh, yes, that was a unanimous vote. Okay. And there's a condition there that with a site plan that Cherry Street would be? 
uh, that Cherry that it would be brought to this to, to council vacate. to consider vacating Cherry Street if a site plan were to come for a project on both sides of that block. But now, if we're since we're going to discuss that, we have to share that there is a business that's directly behind that on Church Street and Railroad Street that's been there for several decades. It's basically going to be damaged significantly if that if Cherry Street is closed on even behind it. As of now, only the technical aspects have of it. That's all that really has been discussed up to this point. So anything beyond just the technical of Decatur Utilities and the engineering departments were both consulted and just on the technical merits had no issues with it. And then the planning commission just forwarding it along with those caveats of only when a site plan were, were brought, then this body would weigh everything else around that issue. Yeah, I mean, I understand what we're looking at here, but again, I, again, since it was brought out, it needs to be noted that there is a business that will be significantly impacted in a negative way if we close off Cherry Street, or if we even close it off at the alley, it's going to be significantly impacted negatively. And and that's part of I you. you know everything okay. that has to be considered whenever we're okay. vacating. I right. just I thought it was only fair that yes, everyone knew that too. All right. Uh, any other discussion? All right. Resolution twenty three zero one four approve abatement of unsafe conditions at sixteen Cherry Street Northwest. Set public hearing for March six, twenty twenty three at six p.m. David. Yes, sir. We'll provide you with the necessary info once the public hearings have been set. These are just routine demos. Okay. The other is uh, resolution twenty three zero one five approve abatement of unsafe conditions at three twenty two. 11th Avenue Northwest. Any questions on either one of those? Have you heard from Ms. Matthews? Just out of curiosity. Mm, Billy, we have, and I truly don't remember all of the conversations. Someone else in the office had it, but we had there have been some discussions with them. Okay. All right, any other questions? All right, public hearings, ordinance 234546, zoning request 141122, two and a half acres located at 2210 8th Street Southwest. Public hearing was set January 3rd, 2023. Uh, yes, this is a recently annexed property looking for a R4 multifamily zoning. Um, this was recommended for approval by the Planning Commission. How many units total? 24, it's three buildings, eight units each. And the site plan has been presented and was given preliminary approval pending this rezoning. Okay. All right. Uh, any questions? Discussion? Resolution 23016 approved request for special event retail liquor license for WIT LLC doing business as JW Steakhouse on behalf of the Alabama Center for the Arts at 133 2nd Avenue Northeast. Event date February 9th, 2020. This is an annual event that the um, Center for Arts does every year. All right, any questions, discussion? All right, uh, resolution 23017, uh, assess $285 against 411 Third Avenue Southwest for cost of abatement of nuisance. David. This is just one that hadn't gone through the system yet. Should a little <laughs> housekeeping. Maybe this will be the last one for a few meetings, I, I hope. All right, any questions? Resolutions, resolution 23018, approved request for special use permit for AT&T to install equipment on an existing tower located at 105 14th Street Southwest. Good afternoon, President, Council Mayor. David Andrews with CMS. Uh, this first resolution is for a special use permit that's been applied for by AT&T. This is to co-locate or install their equipment on an existing tower at 105 14th Street Southwest. AT&T is not providing service at this point currently, so they're wanting th this to be a new uh, point of service for AT&T wireless customers. Uh, it will increase the, the capacity in the area and it will also increase the service area for AT&T in that area. Uh, they're requesting to install 12 antennas on the tower um, and it's a 119 foot monopole. CMS has reviewed the application and recommends approval. All right, any questions? 
Resolution 23019, approve request for special use permit for AT&T to modify equipment on an existing tower located at 2611B Highway 31 South. Yes, sir. This is the existing tower behind the old Nightfall Motel that's been tore down. Uh, AT&T is providing service from this tower. Uh, they're wanting to modify their antennas to provide 5G service, technology upgrade. Uh, they're requesting, currently they have nine antennas mounted on the 148-foot self-support tower. They're wanting to remove three of the old antennas and replace them with six new ones. Now the six new antennas will be half size antennas, so they'll be they'll only take the, the place, so the aesthetics of the facility will not change. CMS has reviewed that application and recommends approval. All right, any questions? Uh, resolution 23020, approve request for a special use permit for Verizon to modify equipment on an existing tower located at 409 Bradley Street, Southwest. Yes, sir. This uh, resolution is for a special use permit that's been applied for by Verizon. They are not currently providing service from this location, so this will be a new service point for Verizon and will increase the service area and capacity for Verizon customers in the, in the park area and Bradley Street area. Uh, they're requesting to put nine antennas on the tower. Uh, it's a 110-foot monopole. CMS has reviewed the application and recommends approval. All right, any questions? Thanks, David. Yes, sir. Resolution 23021 authorize the purchase of a Cat V6 Dozier for the landfill operation. Dozier's everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> we never have to meet. Uh, one to Tyler Landfill and Recycling. We're requesting to uh, purchase this Cat D6 Dozier with the waste handling package for the landfill. You know about my those are woes lately and um, we decided we would need a backup plan uh, to avoid the the rental that we need to um, have an additional equip equipment on site um, for those times when you need maintenance or just down for a new undercarriage so we're requesting that you approve this all right any questions all right, resolution 23022, approve Martin Aquatic for design of a master plan for Point Mallard Kid Play Area. Yes, Mayor Council, Alan Stover with the Community Development Department. Uh, we did RFPs for uh, this work and we feel like that Martin Aquatics has got the best plan. This is a grant that we received from Alabama Tourism uh, to provide a new plan for the child's play area at the, at the park. Just request, requesting your approval. Okay. Any questions? Zero cost of the city. Right. Well, unless we build it. Yeah. Well, that's for further. Yeah. It's a zero match. Yeah. But it covers the design aspect well, of it. I, yes, the design. <laughs> but this would get us ready. Yes. Yeah, right. Just, I mean, this, this is, is the full. just the design. And, and Jason, you know, while we're talking about this area, can you kind of touch on? You know, touch on that and just where it is as far as age and, and maintenance wise and, and, and the need for a potential update if the, the kiddie pool area at the water park uh, has not really been changed uh, since the uh, 90s. Is the two pools that were there um, were, were put in uh, and we have kept them functioning and kept them where they're safe and and but they're they're in dire need of of updating um and as what happens with with commercial public pools is after so long the piping all, all the things that are below ground um those things over time just tend to uh especially under concrete because every bit of that's under concrete so what we're hoping for is to bring a nice kiddie pool play area uh, for the citizens of Decatur and, and the folks that visit the park and actually use that opportunity to update a few things that, that we, we know need updated. I think my first memory as a kid is going down one of those blue slides at the duck pond. Yeah. And I'm, I'm old, so. What? Well, I'm not getting into that. <laughs> I, I'm, yeah, I, I can't do anything but hurt myself on that. So. All right, any other discussion? Thanks, guys. Uh, resolution 23023, approve partial bond reduction and refund for McGee Square 
townhomes for completed portion of public improvements. Uh, yes, we uh, accepted a cash bond for the public improvements uh, for the McGee Square project. They have completed a portion of those and have requested a partial refund. Uh, this was reviewed by the engineering department and DU and was given approval by the planning commission. Since it was in city funds, we just need the formal step of your, this body approving us to refund that amount. Because it was a cash bond. Because it was a cash bond, yes. Okay. All right, any questions? Resolution 23024, approved proposed, proposed site plan location for combined convenience and package store to be located at 914 19th Avenue Southeast. Uh, yes, um, we have a applicant that is proposing to build a new convenience store on this property. It is located within 500 feet of a church, and so their plan to sell alcohol um, would need the approval of the city council of the conditions that the zoning ordinance does lay out. The two that it meets are in the, in the resolution that they do not front on the same street or share a common access and that they have a significant amount of permanent structures that would achieve the buffering and insulating effect that the 500 foot distance is intended for. The distance that has been given us on this preliminary plan is roughly 432 and a half feet from where they're proposing to put the building to where the church is. Is that a straight line or is that? That is a straight, that is a straight line. That's how we measure that, just building wall to building wall. Okay, and so that's not going down the street. That's then. not going down the street and turning this just a straight. Because that's what I was trying to figure out when I was trying to visualize the place, if that was directly from the church or to that point, okay. It's yes, sir. It's just measured right. wall to wall, straight line, the two closest points. All right. Thanks. Are they building a new building on that corner there? That is what they're proposing. I believe tear there's down a tear down the old there, building, build a new one, and yes. then the canopy. So they'll have a, an entry on both sides, though. Potentially off the 19th and. Potentially none of that has gone through. All of that would have to come through site plan review with the planning department and go through, you know, dealing with engineering and everyone. So none of those details are set. This is just to get them the answer on can they move forward with the that full process. engineering of the, the, okay. of the project. They didn't want to get too far down the road without getting an answer and on the this. And the canopy, first. I'm just assuming, is fuel pumps and that's what it looks like from the drawing that has been provided to us. Okay. I guess if the drawing kind of looked like the canopy was far away from the mm -hmm. building, I would assume that it wouldn't be. All right. All right, any other discussion? Resolution 23025, approved purchase and installation of pedestrian crosswalk warning lights on 8th Street Southeast at Decatur Morgan General Hospital by Temple Inc. Yes, Mayor Council, I guess it was requested that Police and I look into a crosswalk um, just across from, I guess, along 7th by the emergency room for their employees crossing the road. And this was to put up the flashing lights in a crosswalk similar to what's in front of the courthouse for them. Okay. And good with that? Yeah. Needed? Uh, yeah, it's. I, I drive through there every day multiple times. They're constantly crossing and depending on the light and the traffic. All right, any other discussion? Resolution 23026, approved street department engineering excavator purchase. Yeah, this is to replace the mini excavator that the street department has uh, through the alley fund. All right, any questions? Resolution 23027, approve ALDOT city agreements lighting project, State Road 20, US 31. Yeah, this is the lighting project that has been going on for a little bit. Engineering work's been completed, and I guess we're getting these agreements together to be able to apply for the permits to do the work, and once we get these in place, we'll put the project out for a bit. All right, any questions? Yeah, I, I mean, I know this project's kind of been going on for a while. I probably should ask this way sooner in the process, but, you know, these are technically our lights. we got to maintain them. Is there, when we send this out for bid, do we have a way we might could bid the maintenance aspect of it as well as it's going out as, as one package? 
package and then the second part to that question is do we have it set up to where we've got access points for maintenance in the future so we don't wind up in the situation we were in now where we've got to go through and just completely gut the entire system of it to answer your first question i think the the construction of it would probably be a different company than maintenance mm -hmm. i think i think you would separate those two so you would go out for bid from for the construction and if you wanted to bid the maintenance of it then yes you, i would think that would be a separate uh, request so i wouldn't put them together no i think it would be two separate things um yes yeah, some of the newer applications of what we're doing should help assist in what's caused the problems today some of the uh, uh fixtures and some of the enclosures should help keep some of the critters out that's created some of the problems today and this is to basically replace it's completely compromised the whole system is correct we're replacing, replacing conduit the lighting yeah. the whole thing. and it's dark it's dark i mean yeah, it's the, dark. the poles will right. remain there the, the same poles you'll, different i'm lights. assuming led uh, led, LED yeah, throughout it's conduit, yeah. wiring yes. controls yeah. lots of it too is yeah. what it looked yes. like on the contract I, I guess my my big concern is that we you know we start getting prepared for for the maintenance of it mm -hmm. um, if Charles needs, you know, obviously we've got to go through these processes and it seems to take a while sometimes, but that's that's just my concern. So we don't get in this type of shape again. I guess surely the, these what, would be far less cumbersome on maintenance, right? LEDs last much longer yeah, I mean, for a good while. They I mean, do, uh, but as long until, as your housings are okay. But until you got critters chewing up the wires, and I think that's what was the early death of some of these. Yep, that was my understanding. All right, any other discussion? I, just to what Mr. McMaster said, you know, you're right. Uh, the rodents are, are somehow drawn to copper, and they go in and they eat this stuff up, and that's what's messed up the, the system. Um, having someone that can give us good advice on whether or not we need to look at a pest control company to, to do some type of maintenance uh, might be a, a good investment to to review. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Um, thanks, Carl. Resolution 23028 approve the replacement of rubber safety surfacing at Delano Playground. Jason. Yes, Mayor Council. Um, this was one of the more used playgrounds in the city. Delano uh, attracts so many visitors, especially at that playground. Um, the area around it, of course, with the, uh, with the walking areas and everything that's been improved. When we did that playground, it is the soft touch, so when kids fall on it, it it's not like falling on a, a hard surface or, or, or anything like that. It's done a great job. Uh, we've repaired it quite a few times already, but it, it just really takes away from the aesthetics, and as far as the repaired places, they they're not quite the same as, as the other. So we're, we're asking that we get this fixed. It's a safety concern, and we would like to see uh, Bill do something about that. All right, any questions? I did go by and looked at that. It's, it's pretty bad if you haven't seen it recently. The patch don't look right. Yeah. All right, uh, thanks, Jason. Uh, resolution 23029, award bid number 23004 for pond management services to Aqua Services. Yes, sir. We sent out uh, seven invitations to bid. We got one back from Aqua Services and Park and Rec Reviews. It looks like they can do these services that are needed. Mostly it's over to uh, Wilson Morgan. Yeah. So it's an initial cost of $10,000 for the initial treatment and about $4,500 per quarter after that to maintain it. This does include the uh, work that we had talked about adding on to this. All right, uh, any other discussion? All right, resolution 23030 authorize the mayor to apply for Rebuild Alabama Act grant for intersection improvements at Old Molten Road and the Beltline. Yes, this is a Rebuild Alabama grant uh, through LDOT, uh, and it is a $250,000 grant. We're just asking Nell's approval to apply for this project. All right, any discussion, questions? What are we actually getting there, Alan? I mean, what's actually going to change at that intersection? What we'll see um, is uh, widening the, to allow for a, a turn lane there at the intersection. Uh, the, there's a, 
more traffic coming through. So what we'll do first, Councilman, is the uh, the, the south side uh, in our first grant application if we're successful. And uh, then the same will happen on the um, north I guess that would actually be the west side. And then the east side uh, would be the second application that we would make if we're successful. That would be on the, where MAPCO is on the Beltline. Both for left turn lanes? Yes. They'd have a dedicated left turn lane? Yeah. Yeah. As a traffic counselor, as you've probably seen, are pretty uh, high through there. Yeah, we had a wreck there today at that intersection, and uh, it looked pretty bad. It might not have been bad at all, but it looked pretty bad. But I guess my concern is, and, and I don't have a problem with this, I, my concern is less than an eighth of a mile away, away we have 8th Street going into the Beltline and people are trying to go across and we've talked about this over and over again and we're having some pretty significant wrecks there and something needs to be done there um, as well to make sure that you know someone doesn't you know get killed there or get booked up pretty bad there. So we, we agree with you. Um, what we've asked for is uh, the ability to put some, something that is uh, very similar to what we have at uh, uh, Cedar Street and the Beltline. That would be that uh, uh, concrete triangle that uh, keeps traffic from just piling into that uh, <clears throat> wide gap there, at, uh, the uh, medium cut on 8th and uh, the Beltline. Mm, okay. I, I don't know if that's... I, I, okay. You're asking to prevent a left turn. Yeah, uh, it, you don't page. need to do a left turn there at all. Yeah. Just uh, right because that's right. where the, the accidents are happening and it needs to just be cut off from that completely. And mm -hmm. I've had, mm -hmm. I've had met several conversations with Dwayne about that and for over years and why we haven't done something. <coughs> um, we do have significant accidents there. And well, we have definitely talked to the LDOT about it. Okay. Um, and so, you know, they'll make the final decision on that road. I understand. Yeah. I just... <coughs> and not only that, uh, making a, a right turn off of 8th Street onto the belt line and trying to get into the left turn lane. That's tough too. Yeah, to turn on the That's tough too. Go across three lanes. Yeah, yeah, that's tough too. But, uh, you know, I was, not too long ago, I was at Richstone and heard a big crash and uh, a guy was trying to come across and got hit and, you know, trying to go back to the left. And it just, it, it's not a good location. And uh, we need to, you know, make that a priority, I think. You're free. All right, um, any other discussion? Thanks, Alan. Ordinance is first reading, Ordinance 234550, amend transient occupancy tax ordinance. It's what was discussed uh, in the previous meeting. It's 3% additional uh, in the corporate limits and 1.5% in the AJs. What we did, we added a fourth paragraph that just adds that on what's already being assessed. And it does have in there that it's designated for recreation designated and for economic recreation development. Recreation and economic development. That's what it's designated for. It's, what, it's in the ordinance. All right. Any questions, discussion? All right. Uh, directors or managers, any anything? Jason. Um, I wanted to address something that came up um, a few weeks ago about the uh, uh, tree cut. Um, Councilman Jackson, we spoke, uh, but in, in that there were some questions about two trees that were supposed to be cut. Well, um, those two trees that came up during that meeting went through the correct process. Now they still are waiting to be cut because where they were prioritized on our tree cutting list was not at the top of that list. DPD came back and said that those trees were not in line of sight. They were not a problem. So we went by that. We called the arborist. The arborist came. They gave us um, designations for those trees. So we added those trees to the trees to be cut list where they're they were set by the harbors, not by our choice or anything else. That's the reason we have a third party to do that. So one of the things, several things I wanted to point out 
is uh, your district, Councilman Jackson, there were seven line of sight issues that were similar that were all handled. They were all taken care of, but those were based on the process. They went through the process through DPD and were recommended to be cut. So, so that's why we did that. In this case, that didn't happen because they weren't recommended to be cut. So they have been put on the list to be cut based on what the Arbor has told us, and they will be cut based on the designation they were given by the Arbor. You finished? I think. Okay. Um, I, I really don't care what DPD or anybody else says. When you go to Second Street and you go to Old Mulch Road, you have to cross the line that DPD and the street department has put down for you to safely stop behind the stop sign. You have to pull out almost into Old Mulch Road, a very busy uh, thoroughfare, uh, to be able to see traffic because of the tree that's to your east. So that one causes problems. And again, I, with all due respect, I don't care what DPD says. It's a dangerous situation. When we look at the one coming out of, uh, Cent what, not Centron, um, out of the Seville, we have a very similar situation. There's a huge hackberry tree there that's blocking traffic. And not long ago, you could see skid marks where people are trying to, to stop from having an accident there. So as Herman and I talked, it's just prior notification. And I've notified that I had a request for it, and we're gonna have an accident there and gonna have a bad accident there, and we can put it off as long as you guys want to, but we're gonna be liable for it. Whoa, whoa, whoa. We're, we're not putting well, I'm just off. saying, okay, I'm just saying it can be put off or it cannot it can not be dealt with. Once again, or it can, we are it, not it can be dealt off. with um, as as it comes down a list or whatever. But we're, that, those are dangerous situations. But you do realize that there are processes we go through. We did follow those processes, and the outcome is what those processes led to. I, I, I heard you, and I, I got that. But I'm just telling you, we've got a bad situation there. But in your district, the statistics say if you were a citizen in your district, you were more likely to have a tree cut around you than anybody, any other district in the city. That, that so to say that... Well, but it was said that if this was in a different district, it would have already been done. And I did say that. And I did say that. And I'd love to see those statistics that you're talking about, too. I'll be happy to show them to I'll you. Be to we can see them after the meeting. Yeah. No, I'd be happy to, turn, to show everybody. Oh, well, that's fine. That's fine. I mean, because apparently somebody's got you trying to prove a point here tonight anyway. But let Nobody's me, got me doing anything. Okay, well, I went to that. you and you said okay. that you were going and to And you and I had a conversation regarding this. And, and you said that you agreed and that you would walk those back. Now, I don't mind talking about the process, but when you say, when if that tree was in a different district, that's accusatory. It is, and you and I addressed that in our conversation when we met one-on-one. -on -one. But it needs to be addressed publicly where it was brought up. That's fine, but let me say this, and I don't have, and I'm not backing off of that. I'm not backing off of that, because this is a dangerous situation, and I said what I said, and I meant what I said. And that's fine, but you you understand there's processes to, to talk to somebody about those processes is how to get it handled, not to accuse somebody of something that's not true. Um, I'm not going to say it's not true. You're saying it's not true. I'm not saying it's not true. So, And you can show me some st statistics, and we can show where trees have been cut. That doesn't really change anything. This is a situation that needs to be dealt with, regardless of what anybody says. Well, Mr. But, Lake. He said she has the statistics. Yes. Can I see them? Can you have some? We'll, 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 if you have them, I'm, I'm good to do it however you want to do it. If you have them after, bring them up here. Right. This is the top page is the tree list and where they are at currently on the tree list. The other stuff, as far as this in here, is the other trees that have been cut, the ones that I mentioned for line of sight. Um, now, it may be better if we go through this together because, like I say, most of these are work orders. But if you just want to go through them and then ask questions later, I don't mind that. We can ask questions if, if anybody has them afterwards. I'll let y'all continue on them, y'all. Well, y'all's bigger in. Well, I'll let take one pass. There's multiple different well, pages. I'm done. I, I, think we, I think we understand. Where well, I thought we were already done, but apparently we weren't, so. 
Well, when something's brought up, you got to understand all those guys that are on that crew. What you're saying is, is they're choosing not to do their job. But that, well, like African Americans, I, but, but, but let's be clear. Now, I told you about a conversation in Texas that I had. You did. I did. That you and never that was, mentioned to me. But but when we talked, and you said you understood where I was because I shared that information with you. But you also said you were going to walk the conversations back about. Uh, if it was in another district, it would have done been cut. No, no, I didn't. That's not. Uh, we I understand think. that conversation. Yeah, okay. Well, then there was a mistake in that. Then, just like you said that you would take care of it. But anyway, but like I said, that's neither here nor there now. But I shared with you why I made that statement. I shared with you exactly why I made that statement. You did, and, but like I like I said, you never brought that up until I met with you. The reason we met is because I called you to meet. But that was the perception that I had based on the statement that was made to me in a, in a text. But letter. when I showed you the information, you can see we went through the processes to do it the correct okay. way. Well, like I said, I shared with you why I made that statement. You know, y'all can just agree to disagree. Yeah, I shared with you exactly why I made that statement. All right, uh, Chief. Uh, Tracy Thornton, uh, Fire Department. Hey, what I was coming to you tonight about is an agreement with uh, a company called First View. Uh, we would like to get that moved to the next uh, council agenda if that's possible. What it is, is we have an emergency reporting software that all our uh, EMS tickets and all our fire reports have to go through. Uh, well, currently we have one called uh, Emergency Reporting. Emergency reporting got bought out by a company called ESO, so we're going to have to change companies uh, one way or the other. Uh, this first part that we're coming to you to ask for was it already in our budget with IT to uh, to do this. It's going to have some things for pre-fire planning, um, truck checks, truck maintenance, station maintenance, that kind of stuff. And uh, I think we kind of got our cart before the horse a little bit, and uh, with the agreement with them. So if we could get that moved to the next agenda, that would be uh, Is would there be a, did you, I thought you said there was a little, maybe a little additional cost so, potentially. So uh, what's gonna happen next. is, is uh, emergency reporting that we did have, they left, so whoever we went to was gonna be an additional cost. So this is gonna be, an, it will be higher. Our emergency reporting software next year will be higher, but we, we're going it's gonna be higher no matter who yeah. we use. Okay. All right, any questions, discussion? Thanks. So we'll make it on the 20th. I'm a, I mean, do you need it on the 6th? Yeah, that, that's no, no issue. Okay. Well, my point is this. It's a pretty lengthy contract, but we'll, we'll get there. I just wanted to, want y'all be able to see it before uh, before next Monday. That's fine. I just want to make sure. It's up to you. Okay. No, it's, it's fine. We can do it the 6th. Yeah, if you can get it out to us. Yeah, we'll, we'll do that. All right. I just learned of it today, by the way. Okay. Yeah. All right, uh, anything else from directors? Mayor? No, sir. Anything else from council? All right, we're adjourned. I don't have to do that. <laughs> All right. Just felt natural.